Welcome everybody to the first, probably not the last, Dash Open House. Thank you for coming. So I was tasked with explaining to you today what is cryptocurrency. So after I have done so, you will have the much greater privilege of hearing from two others. I don't know if they've decided on the order. I'm sure they'll surprise me. All right, so next after me, you will hear from Ryan Taylor. And Ryan Taylor is the oft-called Director of Finance uh, within the Dash Core team. After you've heard from Ryan, you will finally hear from Evan Duffield, who is the founder and lead developer of Dash. And both of them just so happen to be Phoenix locals, which is also great. And once they have finished, the three of us, although I don't imagine you'll have many questions for me, the three of us will take questions for something like 15 minutes, and that will conclude the, the formalities of this event space. All right, so I must give a special thanks to this gentleman here, John, whom I met this evening, because John approached me before the festivities began, and began asking me all sorts of questions. And he helped me to realize, because within the cryptosphere, we can begin to forget that 99.9% .9 of the world has no idea what any of this stuff is. And John helped to remind me of that. And so, what is cryptocurrency? First of all, I'm not going to call it cryptocurrency because I think that's a horrible name that was invented by a nerd, and I'm sorry. Thanks for the invention, leave the name at home. <laughs> so, it's more often uh, you'll hear the term digital currency, and that, of course, I am quite confident that you are likely familiar with. Because if you have a bank account of any kind, PayPal of any kind, uh, you're quite used to sending value in a digital manner. So then what could this other stuff that we're talking about possibly be? Well, there are quite a few people, many in this room, many not in this room, uh, who believe that there is a better way to do digital currency. Uh, a way that, that allows one to be in, in control of what happens to one's units of money. The base element of it is this is a, is a ledger, essentially, a, a digital ledger uh, that's been given the nerd word blockchain. I kind of like that word, but... So this, this blockchain, this ledger, we're also familiar with ledgers, and so it just so happens that in, in the digital currency that we all know and use with banks, that like each bank like keeps their own ledger, right? You do a transaction in, you do a transaction out, they update their own sort of internal ledger. So then what's the difference with what we're talking about today? What is Dash? Well, Dash is a open ledger. It's a shared, common, perfectly auditable ledger. And now we weren't the first one. The first open ledger was called Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is actually how most of the people who work on Dash came into open ledgers to begin with. Most of the people who are interested in any of these sorts of fancy blockchain-based digital currencies came into the open ledger that was called Bitcoin, because it was first. Uh, it was launched in January of 2009 by a pseudonymous person, maybe pseudonymous, <laughs> uh, by the name of Satoshi Nakamoto. And fast forward a number of years later, uh, Evan Duffield, who you'll hear from today, realized this ledger is so fantastic, but I have got to say I've noticed one thing, and that is that with a perfectly open ledger, that would be something like the end of privacy in finances. There would be, there would be no cash equivalent. And, and so Evan thought, well, is there a way to have an open ledger? for it to be perfectly auditable, for the monetary supply to be knowable at every moment of every day, and for every transaction to be provable and recorded to allow us to know the monetary supply at every moment at every day, and yet to also be able to obscure our transactions if we want to. Turns out there is. 
It was born as, I think it was X coin for what, 24, 48 hours? They then decided to call it dark coin for something like a year. And then, what finally, no, I, I paid a bit of attention to them when they were called dark coin, but I do remember thinking that's a silly name. But then in early 2015, they wised up and they did this excellent rebranding to Dash Digital Cash. And so that is, at the very basest level, uh, what we are able to offer. That is transfers of units. I would call them monetary units, but we're not used as money yet. That's the goal. Transfer of units from one account to another on a perfectly open and auditable ledger in a way that you can be private if you want to. Now, there are a few other selling points of Dash that I will cover quickly because, again, I forget. I forget that people don't know all of the stuff that there is to know about Dash. So how do we compare to other cryptos? Maybe you have seen, um, there's a big favorite website called coinmarketcap.com where you can go check the price per coin and the market capitalization of all of the competitors in this space at any old time. And so you will see that Dash is one of many. And so how, do, how are we different? Uh, why are there people in this room who are, who are betting, both literally and figuratively, uh, that Dash is, the, is a good trend to get on in this space? Well, another thing that Evan and Ryan figured out is um, in order for this ledger to be even something that any of us would want to use as a money in real time with real people, is that the element of cash, there's a, there's, privacy is an element of cash, but what's the other element of cash that makes us love it so much? Is that when we hand someone cash, we know we're done with the transaction. The transaction is complete. The merchant doesn't have to worry that we'll do a chargeback on them, you know, like, like I've heard happens a lot on PayPal. The merchant doesn't have to worry uh, about you know, when, it, when is this transaction going to clear? Is it, it two days? Uh, when, when will this money be available to me as liquidity? Uh, so, so the other great thing, other than privacy, about cash is that it allows us to feel confident in the moment of sale that this is legit, this is secure, we're done here. And you might not believe me uh, if you don't know a lot about cryptos, but it is true that there is no other cryptocurrency, I'm sorry, digital currency, in this entire space that I'm aware of, let me know if I'm wrong, that can do an instant transaction. I think the one that is the nearest is something like many 15 seconds out, but even then that's one block found. We're not gonna go into that. So allow me to, to kind of to like gra drive home the gravity of that for you, if I may. Dash is the only digital currency that is able to offer an instant transaction. And in, in nerd speak, that means that the merchant doesn't need to worry about getting double spent. If you want to see how a Bitcoin double spend works, I invite you to visit a website called glasshunt.io. And they're a bunch of kind-hearted hackers who have basically made an online tool available to show people that any digital currency, in this case Bitcoin, is unsuitable for real world commerce if you can snatch the payment right back from the merchant after you walk out of the door. You can do that with Bitcoin if you, you use glasshunt.io. So, I've talked to you a bit about privacy, I've talked to you a bit about uh, instant transactions, and, and the final thing that I would like to talk to you about in terms of, you know, first, why am I here talking about Dash today, right? There are a lot of places I could be. Uh, and actually, this, the main reason I was attracted to Dash is that in my point of view, uh, this blockchain business is bookkeeping 2.0. It's really just very fancy, very technical, just kind of glorified uh, bookkeeping. And bookkeeping, bookkeeping is very important. And if we're offering bookkeeping, 
We're service providers, which means we're bookkeeping as a, bookkeeping as a service, money as a service, M-A-A-S. I don't know if that'll ever get used widely. I would like it if it did. Money as a service. And so if we're service providers, certainly we need to be able to function like service providers. Certainly we need to be able to come to an agreement on what features our product should have and be able to roll it out in a timely manner. And we should be able to pay the people we need to roll these features out in a timely manner. And we should be able to pay all of these computers that are like blip, 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 blipping all around the world right now, keeping the dash ledger current and secure right now. Certainly all these people should be able to be paid. And that's another major differentiator about Dash in that not only do we pay, if you've never heard of these words, forget I ever said them, but not only do we pay our miners, but we pay our master nodes. And we have a treasury left over that allows us to hire, we hire Ryan, we hire Evan, we hire me, we hire several people in this room. There are several people in this room who get paid magic internet money to work on Dash today, and it's awesome. And, and it's created, as I've heard other people put it, a positive feedback loop in that the more value we bring to customers, the more Dash we sell. The more Dash we sell, the higher the value of a coin, and the higher the value of a coin, the greater the purchasing power of our treasury. So that just to me seemed like a winning formula. And so almost a year ago, I asked the Dash Network for a job, and they said, yes, you can make YouTube videos for us. And I said, thanks. And that's still what I'm doing to this day. So if you'll notice when you sat down, uh, you may have seen a little card on your seat. That is the name of the YouTube show that I produce with my partner, Pete. It's called Dash Detailed. We publish every Wednesday and Friday. Wednesday is a sort of news update show, if you care to be kept in the loop about developments in the digital currency Dash. And then Friday is an interview show where I seek to show you the real faces of the real nerds and investors and people who are behind Dash because you don't want to see me all the time. I wouldn't. And so, yeah, so I invite you to do that. And with no further ado, and please, please will you stand right where I'm standing for the live stream purposes, here is Ryan Taylor. Well, I like to walk around quite a lot, so this is going to be quite the challenge for me <laughs> to stand in front of the cameras the whole time. I'd normally be right over there and back over here. Um, well, first of all, before, before I get into it, um, thank you all sincerely uh, for coming out. Uh, seeing this many people in the room for a simple open house, it, it truly warms my heart to see that all the work that we put in to our currency is getting such support. And we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing without all of the investors, users, volunteers that have sacrificed literally for years to get to the point that we're at, a point where we are self-sustaining and truly able to employ our workforce and everything. It's, it's really been an incredible journey. It's an, a journey no other coin has gone through. And um, I, I think that's a segue into what I wanna talk about, which is uh, the inevitability of our situation that we're in right now. Um, and I'll expand on, on that idea, but uh, before I do, um, as I, I've been involved with the coin since early 2014, first as just a regular community member, then I moved here uh, for personal reasons, reached out to Evan, started a relationship and started uh, talking about what features and things should be incorporated next and, and how do you really gain adoption with users, how do you uh, basically phase it through to the point that you can continue to grow it 
and I became more and more involved. Um, and last year I quit my job and, and joined Dash full time for something like 700 bucks a month or something in order to see it continue to grow. And Dash's growth has been astounding. We've had triple digit growth every single year. And in our fourth year, we already have triple digit, nearly quadruple digit growth in 2017. So what is this growth doing for us? So we started out this journey solving one problem, which was privacy. How do we make transactions more private? Nobody wants their balances published on a ledger for all the world to see. Nobody wants their transactions published on the ledger for all the world to see. Some people and organizations do need transparency. If you're an NGO, a nonprofit of some type, you might want your transactions actually visible. And so you need to provide both, and we came up with a solution to do that. Next, we recognize that Bitcoin transactions take a really long time. I don't know about you, but I don't like sitting around waiting 60 minutes to see if my uh, transaction went through to make a purchase. No other payment system is like that. And so we went about solving that issue. Next, we recognized that there was a governance issue in Bitcoin. And gosh, governance is really important. We need an explicit means to make decisions on our network before it becomes an issue for us. So we introduced a simple voting mechanism at the time, early 2015. And at that point, then you start to recognize, well, this isn't sustainable. We can't get people to volunteer their time on this project forever. And we can't get people to donate um, and have a bunch of coattail riders on board. And it's not working for Bitcoin either. Every year, their donations drop to the Bitcoin Foundation. So that's not a sustainable model. We need something better. And so we rolled out the budget, the, the proposal system that allows people to anyone to put up a proposal that's going to benefit the network and receive a block reward or reward for going and doing that effort. And so we've become self-funding. We're not dependent on donations from interested corporations that want to influence our work. We're here to serve our users. And I don't think that uh, you know anything else uh, existed like it at the time. We really became the first decentralized autonomous organization. And so we have this long history of solving problem after problem. And now we're laser focused on usability. Right now, cryptocurrency is way too hard for most people to use. You have to be dedicated to learning how to use it, be willing to overcome your fears when you type that first cryptographic address in, Hope you didn't mistype anything, not realizing that you've got about a one in bil billion chance of, of having the transaction actually accepted if you mistyped it. Uh, but it, it's a real barrier. This is not going to become a tool that is usable by the masses unless we address this issue. And meanwhile, we see many others in the space debating about some technical detail, block size, all kinds of stuff that users don't care about. They're addressing the wrong things. And we're making sure that, first of all, everyone at Dash rose in the same direction. We have a strategy. We have an end vision in mind. And we're laser focused on executing against that vision. Um, we have investors that are aligned with that vision. We have users that are aligned with that vision. Even our miners are aligned with that vision. We just had about the fastest transition from one version to the next in history. A hundred hours is all it took for all of our miners to switch over to the new version. Compare that. So we have a very strong, cohesive community that all share a common vision. And I think that that allows us to be far more nimble and move far more quickly towards a usable cryptocurrency. 
Now, I said at the beginning uh, a little bit about uh, inevitability. Ever since I've been involved in this project, it has felt to me a lot like fate. At every step and every turn that, that, and every obstacle that we, we came up against, the right person showed up that said, hey, I'll volunteer to solve that issue for you. Or just when capacity was running out on, uh, in one of our departments and we didn't have any money to pay anybody, somebody, somebody else would show up. Or just as we solved one of the issues that we thought Bitcoin was going to face, they started facing them. And people took a look at what we'd done and said, hey, those guys anticipated that. And, and they've addressed it already. And so it seems like every single turn, there's been this element of fate. And if you know me well, you know that fate is not something that I really believe in. And so I thought about this a little bit, and, and I thought, no, th this is inevitability. What I'm feeling is inevitability. And there's a distinction between the two. Fate is something that you cannot control, something that happens to you, and it happen it, it, it's directed upon you by some supernatural being. But that's not what's happening here. What's happening is an inevitable shift in the marketplace for digital currencies. And here's why. And, and here's, here's what I, I settled on. And, and inevitability is basically something that is, is uh, eventually going to happen. It doesn't say anything about whether or not you're in control of that happening. I happen to think we are. And, and here are the reasons why. If you look at the Bitcoin Foundation, and other donators of developer time. Bitcoin Foundation got, in their most recent IRS 990 filing, somewhere around $396,000 in donations. They filed that in August. And last year was Bit, uh, Dash's first full year of having a treasury system. And that treasury system, on the date that the Dash was paid out, produced about $660,000 in treasury funding. So last year, we kicked out the $660,000. We were able to do a lot with it. We've got somewhere around 32 paid employees, part-time and full-time. We funded a PR firm. We funded a, a plethora of different marketing activities, a YouTube show, all kinds of things because people are passionate about this project and they're willing to work very hard for peanuts in order to see our vision happen. But here's what's happened since. With the market cap growth that we've seen this year, we're uh, kicking out about $600,000 a month at this point. <laughs> And it doesn't stop there. At $600,000 a month, so that's around $7 million a year that we're kicking out at this point. That funds, and we just did two things, started paying our team full market rates. And two, we more than doubled the size of our full-time payroll and nearly doubled the size of, of our employee base in a single month. We're hiring for 18 new full-time positions and five part-time ones on top of the 14 full-time positions and I think it's about 16 or 18 part-time positions that we already have. We're gonna be able to do a lot with that and people aren't going to have to have side jobs anymore. They're not gonna have to work on their side business in order to make ends meet. They're gonna be able to dedicate their time to Dash and so let's compare that with Bitcoin. I, it's very hard to find out how many full-time developers are working on Bitcoin, but uh, I saw that Bitcoin Core claims to have somewhere around 17-ish, they, they say more full-time programmers. There are about three that are working through MIT's program, 
there's a handful of others. Not only are we able to fill, uh, fund more developers, we're able to fund more of all the other resources you need. Marketing, PR, uh, finance, HR, all of the things that keep an organization running. <clears throat> and so I believe that we're moving far faster than any other uh, digital currency out there. And that's at our current scale. Now let's assume we keep growing. If we produce a product that can appeal to a much broader audience, and I believe it's many, many times larger than the current set of digital currency users. If we're able to produce this product and reach a massively larger audience, I would argue that our market cap should be much, much larger than Bitcoin's. But let's just assume we match it. If we were to match Bitcoin's market cap, the annual production of our treasury, are you ready? $185 million a year. How many developers can I hire? More than we need. I joked at Miami, uh, the Miami Bitcoin conference uh, here in January, I joked that by the end of the year, we might have a Super Bowl ad. And I'm starting to think that's possible. <laughs> because if we continue to grow at an exponential rate, a couple million bucks on an ad would not be a big deal to a $185 million budget. Now, if you ex it, assume that we can reach 10x of Bitcoin because we make cryptocurrency useful, the sky's the limit. We're talking about over a billion dollars a year in funding that we can use to grow our ecosystem, to encourage adoption, to pay for integrations. And this is this has been our secret weapon. People keep discounting. Oh, well, they're too small. Oh, well, you know, they've only been around since their, their trading volume is too low. I hear all kinds of objections. But there aren't any transactions on the blockchain. Well, when you start from a small base and you have exponential growth, yes, it starts out sm small. But small numbers have a tendency to become very big very quickly. And if you look at, we've all heard this parable about the, the guy who like bet a king a grain of rice on the first square of a checkerboard and said, just pay me two on the next one, four on the next one, etc." And pretty soon he was, his whole kingdom was like five feet deep in rice uh, in order to pay this guy off. Uh, exponential growth is a powerful thing. Warren Buffett talked about it, uh, you know, uh, I think Einstein used to talk about it. It is an incredible thing. And here's what's happening. We've had exponential growth, five, you know, three-digit exponential growth for years. And now we're pretty big. Exponential growth from here is going to be very impactful. Very impactful. I keep saying my biggest issue at this point is growth not money, it's not resources. We have to grow the organization in a smart way. We have to grow our ecosystem in a smart way. And growing fast and efficiently is hard. So there will be efficiency losses as we do this. We're probably going to have to throw money at problems. But I think we need to be willing to do that in order to continue the momentum and growth. And so, um, I'll talk about one more thing and that'll be done because I, I have a feeling I'm going way over my time. Uh, but uh, I brought a laser pointer because I had a slide. <laughs> and maybe the people in the video won't be able to see this, but I had a basic slide that had a, a nice chart on it with a X axis and a Y axis. <laughs> All right? Who's the bottom of the window as your axis? I want people to see, so we'll, we'll go up there. So, um, <laughs> in any case, uh, people talk to me about, well, 
Dash just isn't as secure as the biggest blockchains. This is an objection I hear from business owners. Now, forget the fact that our trading volume is now larger than the Bitcoin trading volume at the date that they launched their business. And forget about the fact that our hash rate is now larger than Bitcoin's was at the time that they launched their business on Bitcoin, that users won't use it. But um, in any case, they argue that it's not secure enough because if, if this access is how much money is spent on mining and the y-axis is how much, mon how much security you get, it's not a linear curve. Spending twice as much on mining does not get you twice as much security. It's a, a, a curve that looks like this. It plateaus up at the top. And you can spend more and more and more, right? What do you get for it? What economic value does it produce? Well, it's good for mining equipment manufacturers. <laughs> you might try to argue it's good for miners, but it's not. More miners are going to show up and erode away any excess uh, earnings that you have. So what do you do once you reach this plateau? Do you keep spending more or do you partition off a part of it? Sorry, I'll do it over here for the video folks. You partition off a part of it and you use it, use it for something that's productive. And that's what we've done. We've taken that unproductive portion of mining allocation and we've allocated it towards treasury. We've allocated it towards incentivizing master nodes to actually uh, run servers on our network and, and allow it to grow. And God forbid, a portion of the treasury just doesn't get used. Those are coins that are never produced and don't dilute the coins that are in the hands of our users. And so any of those purposes is a better purpose than continuing to spend, and this is what Bitcoin spends on mining, $650 million a year to secure your coffee transaction. Maybe you know, a nice piece of jewelry. It's excessive, it has no value, and our network, at the end of the day, is simply more efficient. It produces more value than the legacy cryptocurrencies. And I believe that in very short order, what you're going to see is other cryptocurrencies that mimic our system are gonna to come to dominate the field. I'm saying it right now. All of this equates to one thing. Going back to inevitability. We have reached the point where Dash is too large. It's still a small fraction of Bitcoin's size, but it is too large. It is now inevitable that our product is going to be better than theirs. It is inevitable. When you throw more resources at it, and you do it in a more efficient way and in a more well-rounded way. We don't just have developers, we have marketers, we have uh, testers, we have um, you know, every business function that you can imagine. And so putting, putting this all together, I have stopped telling my family and friends that this venture is too risky because I can't justify that anymore. I believe that we've entered a stage in which the outcome is inevitable. And so that's basically, um, you know, maybe it's one year, maybe it's two years, maybe it even takes us three. But it is inevitable that this is going to happen. Economics don't lie, it will happen. So with that, I'll, I'll pause. I'm sure there'll be questions at the end, but we'll let uh, Evan have some air time here. Great job, Ryan.
fantastic turnout, uh, just incredible. And um, there's definitely like an energy in the room. Like, I think we found our people. It's been an incredible experience over the last <laughs> years, you know? <laughs> Thank you. Tao of Satoshi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I also want to thank Ryan, who basically has taken over the core DAO at this point. I am I'm acting more as an advisor role t to date, and he's been doing a fantastic job. I'd like if you guys would be willing to give him a hand. Um, the, the idea of having a DAO that is a YouTube channel, it's like um, those girls that go to Comic-Con, like, and then they have like the YouTube channels, like, but you're like the, the Dash version of that. It was just brilliant, like. We owe our success to these people. I just had the like very small idea of like how to do the economic model at the beginning that fixed the Bitcoin issues. Like it put there there were holes in their boat, right? And so we've we've went into this this exponential growth. The the company model of running a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization, it works. We're the first one. Like and we can replicate that over and over again. So what I want to do and what the Bitcoin people have done that I think we should, we should replicate because it's a really good idea is to have more than one implementation other than C++. It's important because we need different perspectives. We inherited code from other people um, and it was at a time in 2008 during the financial collapse and there was a lot on these people's minds when they were writing it. It's kind of like spaghetti. It's very difficult to understand and I've only ran into a few people that can, and we have them at Dash Core, right? But what if we could make a more simplistic, easier to understand implementation in a Pythonic language like Go? <laughs> See, we have, we have some people that know, like, this, it's a good idea to have, to have something else like that. So, I mean, oddly enough, I just met two people, one that knows Go, as I was coming out here, and one that knows MongoDB, which is, could be a really cool way of um, converting Sentinel over so that we can actually fix the sharding and scalability issues of the network. Like, I figured that out while you were talking just now. Like, it came out of you. <laughs> like, the, there's like a really good idea in there where we could shard the database off into like 256 places using Mongo and, it, and then use it as a value key store and from, from that, we can pretty much grow to any size of transactional volume, right? And that, that's something that could happen now with a separate implementation. And then the core team, they'll work lockstep in us. We'll work together as two independent organizations, two DAOs, wow. both with funding from the blockchain. So this is going to be like a locally ran thing here. Also, it'll have its own internet presence, its own Slack. So like, I, I think that's how our economy expands. We don't even know what to do with the money if it does grow like that, right? Like, you, you have no idea. We, we, would, we would just start putting it in bank accounts or something. Like, <laughs> like what do you do? And so, yeah, exactly, no banks. <laughs> no, no banks. Hardware <laughs> wallet. So what we need to do is we need to, we need to fund the other parts of the economy. We need branch offices next. That can be a DAO. And it can run on this, this Go software or it could run on the third implementation. And then like maybe we just like look at the different countries, figure out what they like, what types of languages they like. We put a foundation in those places. And then we start building out a new implementation again. And suddenly we have 12 implementations all ran by different DAOs on our network, completely decentralized. Like that, that takes a lot of money to do, and it kind of solves the, the, the issue, I think. <laughs> <laughs>
so like this is this is kind of what I've been thinking about over the last few months is how I'm going to be interacting with the project and I currently run the foundation as executive director I'm going to get a special seat on the board as an advisor and I also took my master notes down I, I feel like if if I have this much influence I don't want to be voting for my own ideas through the network it sounds like corruption right so I, I want to be an outside observer <coughs> And I kind of want to fund a lot of these like new thriving companies within the space. And then we'll fund them through the Dow system. Very nice. It could be an interesting. <laughs> um, and so I, I, I don't think I have that much else to say. I, th I thank you all for coming out. It's been an incredible experience. And uh, I'll turn it back to Amanda. Okay. So yeah, we'll just take uh, perhaps like 15 minutes of Q&A. I think that's the time we're allotted in this space. First question in the light blue shirt. Hi. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for what you've done for my family from the investment I've made in Dash a long time ago. Secondly, I would like to ask, we know originally, you know, back years ago, people talked about the unbanked in the world. And they talked about how the, the I'll be quick, I'm sorry. Um, what I'm looking for is what is some altruistic goals and ideas and thoughts of what Dash can do to humanity and to the world? Absolutely. Where is that in your mind and, and, and what your thoughts are? Mm -hmm. More than just helping us you know, pay the bills yeah, and I'd, pay so I'd, the I'd, table. I've been thinking okay. about you. So I'll just repeat the question. Uh, the question was, what are what are one's thoughts of altruism for what Dash will do for, for people? people? Yeah. A fantastic question, and one I've been like pondering, you know, myself. I think that when when you have a, a giving perspective in life, that it actually comes back to you more more than what you even gave, right? And, and it, it just makes sense to, to structure things like that. It's, um, it's a like, type of gifting economy, right? And so you can, make, you can make foundations that run way more efficiently on cryptographic currency and model them after the DAO model. And then you, you give them like an open ledger of an English legalese type of, of recording ledger where they, they can record their milestones and their missions and, and what they've done and complete completely transparent ledgers about everything that's happening. And then you structure it on the back end so that the, the voting um, is like decentralized, collateralized voting, and, and then that, that rules out a lot of the corruption side because everything's provable. And then you can scale up a bunch of those, like they should, they should work way better. So for me, um, I think with what we are building with Dash, it is, we're doing it in a way that intentionally addresses the unbaked. And, and I'll, I'll talk a couple of ways about that without going into too much detail. But um, the only requirement to be able to hold Dash is access to a device, like a smartphone will do, um, and access to an internet connection. And so not every country in the world is fully addressable. But there are a lot of poor countries that nonetheless meet those two requirements. And I've talked to people at conferences that are from Haiti or Venezuela or places where inflation is incredibly high. And you talk to people who cash out, they get a paycheck every single day. They cash it out for US dollars and literally stuff it under the mattress. Those people shouldn't have to go through that. And they shouldn't have to live with an incompetent central bank or an incompetent government. So if you uh, give people a choice, a real choice, to use a currency that is stable, generally increasing in value, and uh, uh, basically allows them privacy and freedom from a corrupt government, you allow them to thrive. And when you do that, you open up incredible amounts of wealth. Uh, and it doesn't need to be a lot for these people to make a huge difference. 
And so I think that by making Dash usable by everyday people, you, you can access folks like that. And when you access folks like that, um, I, I think that it actually removes power from a government who is freely printing money for their own purposes and diluting the wealth of their citizens in order to maintain their power. And you take away one funding source from them. And that can have even more profound political impact in the world. And so I think that digital currencies in general have this power, but I think you need to make it usable to everyday people before you can truly experience that impact. We already see it today in Venezuela, there are brokers that allow people to transfer their wealth into Bitcoin and Dash. And people use it because they know that their own currency is gonna drop in value if they hold that. And so there's already this value that's being created. Now one of the things specifically that I'll talk about with evolution, um, we are going to run it on, if you know anything technically, on certain um, protocols and, and, and certain ports that the government can't shut down unless they want to shut down the internet. And so it will be unfilterable. It will be encrypted. And so no government is gonna make that choice to shut the internet off, to stop Dash. So I think that even in corrupt places, we can reach. take the next question, I just wanted to encourage you all, I realize it has not yet been mentioned, if you're wondering what we're meaning when we say make digital currency usable, because it currently isn't, uh, the word that Ryan mentioned, evolution, you can see a preview of Dash's evolution. If you do a keyword search on YouTube for evolution preview, now that I think about it, if you look for evolution preview on Dash Detail, you'll be able to get a visual of exactly what it is that we're talking about. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Hi, Peter Steinmetz. Um, question actually from Mr. Duffield. Um, first point of clarification, do I understand correctly then that you have shut down all the master nodes which you directly or indirectly control? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the second question is, you apparently pre-mined or insta-mined about mm -hmm. one to two million dash coin at the beginning. <laughs> and the argument should be worth, I don't know how much now, $180 yeah. million dollars or something like that. Um, so, <laughs> so <laughs> the, the, in the past, you've explained that well, the community wanted to mean that you know you you attributed this to a computer bug, and then you explained that the community wanted you to continue to hold those coins on the basis of a vote. At the time that that vote was taken, did you, how much of the uh, voting power from the master notes did you control? Yeah, that wasn't a master note vote. That was pre-master note case. Oh, okay. So you just decided then, basically, to retain these can, can you million dollars? Yes. For the viewers use? back at home, we have just had the token Instamine question that happens <laughs> at every event, and we'll answer it again like okay, we always please. do. <laughs> I have 256,000 coins to my own possession. I am, I'm going to give away four-fifths of them back to the community oh. and, and sponsor many DAOs. Okay. I want to fund all of them, and so it's not my money. I'm keeping it for those companies. I'm gonna like have a slot system, it's gonna be democratic. I won't even pick like what's happening, you know. Oh. Yeah. Well, I'm just curious. Because no, that, that's like, yeah. but so 256,000 coins is how much money? Yeah. Well, like yeah. not, not what, what number did you say? Yeah. I think, yeah, it was gonna be, I think people estimated two million. Uh -huh. Yeah, two let million. Me, let me address that one. Yeah. So there were two million total coins produced in the first 48 hours. Okay. Uh, he did not get them all. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I actually did a, a pretty interesting analysis because I wanted to do my own due diligence on this issue. Sure. And uh, I published it. Um, I basically made a bunch of very generous assumptions, like that the first couple hundred blocks were all him and only him, uh, and that no one else was mining it, and therefore that was probably the capacity that he had to mine. I made a bunch of uh, assumptions, I, I, I won't go through the full list, right. but there was a very long list of assumptions. Everybody on the network was getting rejects at the time, um, and I came to a number that was very close to that, independently. Uh, that analysis is, is published, I should probably put it somewhere, but uh, it's on the 
it's on Bitcoin Talk. Um, I, I but the you to do so because, I mean, yeah, I'm, it is I, published. I don't bring this up to be hostile. Yeah. No, it's a good question. I, I wanted to just, yeah, I wanted yeah. to say like, um, yeah. Well, let me let me. You can have it back, actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, like uh, you gave your perspective of that, and I wanted to give mine. Uh, at the beginning, I had three computers in my closet. I was mining CPU computers. I used to run cl closet computers like my whole childhood, right, with air conditioners and stuff. So, like at the beginning of this, I, I just had that little bit of computing power. I compiled it at the time that that it went out, and I published the the code at the time of compilation, and I mined. Like, what is the issue with that? Right. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll I'll say one more thing and close it. Uh, the second piece of evidence that I think we can point to is that a lot of people have come forward since that have said, I mined it too, here's my wallet, and have shown screenshots and so on. And so between the evidence on Bitcoin talk of people saying, hey, I got my miner up and blah, 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 with timestamps and all of that, uh, between the analysis that I did and, and, and the fact that uh, uh, you know, all of these other people have come forward and said, no, here, here's evidence that I was mining 20% of the coins or whatever. This issue has, as far as I'm concerned, been put to bed many, many times. Um, it will continue to come up, and we do need to continue to convince people that Evan is not going to dump 50% of the coins on the market instantly, <laughs> and the price is going to crash and all of that. So um, it's unfortunate that it happened. It is too late to do anything about it after people started trading it. We can't restart the coin. We do have to live with it. And uh, all we can do is be transparent about what happened, uh, be transparent about the situation, how many coins he currently holds. And, uh, you know, I, I think that that's the best we can do. There is nothing magical about the 45%, 45%, 10% split that we picked early on to say, here's how much goes to mining, here's how much goes towards master nodes, and here's how much goes towards treasury. Uh, I think that if we're going to change it, it needs to be on the basis of academic research and um, mathematical research and independent research that says that there is a safe level of mining that you have to produce and what level of security for how large of a transaction that will provide and be able to publish that before we would really start messing around with it because it's working. Uh, we have a huge advantage over everybody else in the space at this time uh, with the current split even. But if you can reallocate some of that 45% that goes towards mining, as long as you do it slowly and are fair to the miners. I don't want to drastically change it. They've made an investment in our ecosystem and I would never change it quickly. But if you determine that only 10% is needed for mining to be more than secure, then you can reallocate it towards valuable purposes. Any of those three valuable purposes that I talked about earlier, either increasing masternode rewards, which would necessarily increase the ROI on a masternode, the return on investment, and would drive masternode demand. It could increase the number of masternodes that we have. It could drive investment into our ecosystem, et cetera. The second, treasury, towards any other purpose. The third is just not letting those coins ever be, be created. Uh, any of those things produces value. And so I think that uh, we should be open-minded about the issue, but should be driven by data and research. So I think in the near future, we may fund that research in order to make our, our coin more efficient. Because if we don't, 
someone else will optimize a coin to do it better than we do, and guess what? They'll eventually erode our market and win. And so we have the advantage now, if we fund it, and we optimize our coin first, there's no catching up to us. So I think it's an important issue, and I think we should address it. I think it's a great question. I'd like to add one thing. Um, so I, I've been thinking about this for a while, and we, we have like tossed around this idea of collateralized mining, which is a really cool way of, of taking the miners, and then you use, you use contracts with like providers of mining, and then you just have, you end up having like three major pools controlling most of the share of the network and then we can actually control how much each of those pools controls as a group of master nodes. So it kind of reverses the logic. And then from that, you can reduce the amount that, that you spend on mining because it's collateralized at this point. To control it, you also have to buy units of our currency and that's expensive. And so it gets more expensive at, at, as you like, um, as you lower the amount as well, and, and then we can do research uh, and, and figure out exactly what those numbers are and, and how to do it. But yeah, we definitely could do it. Uh, I will say that this is the end of this round of questions. As I had said, uh, any and all of you are invited to go to this restaurant afterward. And if you would like to converse with many of the people in this room uh, online, to get further questions answered, to learn more, and any and all of those things. Hey, maybe even you'll put in a proposal yourself and you will join our network and we will employ you because you are skilled. Uh, I invite you to visit the site dashnation.com slash chat. Yep, and at that site you will see links to all of our social forums online. So dashnation.com slash chat. Thank you everybody. <laughs>